This photograph, taken earlier at the same site, shows just how much erosion has occurred. All the green area and vineyard in the foreground has been completely eroded, as an eddy formed at the point of the rock shown in the middle of the photograph. This solution, quote unquote, is short term. It's very costly, and it's very destructive in terms of habitat. So gravel bar skimming provides a solution whereby we can reduce the hydraulic force against the bank and avoid these types of repairs, which are expensive and destructive. This is a different view of the same rock repair upstream of the Geyserville Bridge. It shows how destructive this practice can be and also how expensive it can be, but it'll be something that many landowners in the valley will be facing if erosion is left unchecked as a result of channel filling and bars becoming high point bars. This will be the same situation many will face to protect their land against erosion, vineyards, and homes, as well as infrastructure. Obviously, a longer term solution is needed. So we've now seen the history of channel aggradation or sediment filling and the trends toward a more meandering, erosive stream and one that fills and avulses and takes over the whole valley floor. The width and pattern of the river is out of sync with the natural balance of flow and sediment, and thus the behavior is unstable. The problems of lateral erosion, loss of flood capacity, risk of avulsion are real, and how is what are some of the ways that we might be able to approach this? Well, actually, in-stream mining does provide some relief. One way to control erosion is to take down the gravel bars, reduce their height to the former alternate bar height. In doing this, the hydraulic force is diminished greatly along the outer bank, and an overflow relief is provided. This diagram shows a grading plan for the bar just upstream of the Geyserville Bridge, also with an extended off-channel wetland area that can be created by lowering the land surface to the water. This done on many bars in the Sire Reach will help reduce erosion and loss of land. Another solution for bank protection is to install bioengineered bank protection structures. These include hard elements like rock and logs, backfilled with soil and vegetation plantings. The vegetation plantings provide root strength in the banks and also habitat value. The irregular shape of the bank increases habitat diversity by improving the hydraulic diversity of the bank so that fish can find various cover areas to feed and to hold. This is a great solution for the Russian River. This is an example of a riprap bank. It's not exactly as designed for bioengineered structure, but it does show that willows can grow through dense rock. If a little bit of mindful design is used, and a little less rock, and at a lower elevation, these structures could be dramatically improved and perform the same erosion control function. With the Alexander Valley rapidly eroding, a combination of sediment removal by bar skimming and installation of these structures should help alleviate a lot of erosion. This is another example of bank protection. It also shows the use of gabions and, uh, which are rock-filled baskets, and fabric and vegetation plantings. You can see the vegetation plantings are kind of collected around the soil between the cages. The gabions are not really recommended most of the time. They can be used buried into structures, but still the point is that willows can thrive in a structure that's fairly hard. And with a little mindful use of bioengineering, we can improve these structures greatly. Another interesting part of the Russian River history in the Alexander Valley is the history of the Geyserville Bridge. Here's a photograph looking at the bridge in the southwest direction from the east bank, showing the bridge structure and the piers supporting it that are on the riverbed. These piers are sunk deep with pilings. This bridge lasted until 2005, and dramatic changes demonstrate some of the issues associated with their channel filling with sediment and bank erosion. This photo shows the Geyserville Bridge in April 2003 looking upstream. You can see that the bridge piers are more exposed than they were in the 1930s. This is owing to the bridge constriction itself, which forces flow through a narrow area and thus scours to more deeply. There's a large scour hole in the foreground. As well as debris catching on the pier can also increase scour. Scour tends to happen also because of land reclamation and river mining and channel reclamation practices. On New Year's Eve of 2005, just before New Year's Day 2006, a large flood occurred and actually damaged the Geyserville Bridge beyond repair. What happened was that the piers scoured and sank, and the bridge deck shows this tilting in the lower photograph as a result. Thus, the structurally damaged bridge had to be destroyed and replaced with a new one. 
The following sequences show some of the elements of why this occurred, which have to do with the bar building up upstream and the channel taking an acute angle of attack. This photograph shows the new bridge being built on the left in 2006 and the old piers on the right. You can see the first two piers in the foreground are actually tilted to the downstream direction, which is to the right, and that shows the effect of the scour damage. In other words, for, flow forced through the bridge crossing undermined the pier and caused it to sink, thus breaking the bridge deck. It's interesting to note that upstream, a large bar, which you can see on the far left side of the photograph, built up over time and caused an acute angle of flow attack. Here's the new bridge during a flow that occurred in 2007. You can see now that the piers are pretty much smaller and they're actually sunk a lot deeper, so this bridge and the abutments of the bridge are pretty well stable. The approach fills, the land area that approaches the bridge of the roadway, is subject to erosion and was recently repaired by Caltrans for a million and a half dollars. This occurred on the upstream west side of the bridge. Here's a photograph, March 2010, of the bank erosion upstream of the Geyserville Bridge. You can see the vineyard land is being lost. The bank is about 15 to 20 feet high. If you look on the far upper right corner of the photograph, you'll see willow vegetation growing on the point bar. That's the bar, what we call bar nine. And as that point bar has developed and grown and moved laterally, it's caused this bank to retreat about 200 feet. And again, the angle at which this flow comes into the bridge was the problem that destroyed the original bridge. Here's a wider view of that same erosion site upstream of the Geyserville Bridge on the west side. You can see the erosion on the left bank, but look at the willows and the stabilization of that bar on the right side. That's a bar that's gone from being a low alternate bar in the early mid-90s to a high point bar by the early 2000s. This bar has come up anywhere between 8 and 14 feet, and bar 9 is one of the bars that's proposed for mining. This will help alleviate the hydraulic force and the in 2007, the bar just upstream of the Geyserville Bridge, shown to the right of center in this photograph, had accumulated up to about 14 feet of new gravel. This forced the point bar to form and forced the channel to the west side. Thus, the flow angle of attack to the bridge was 45 degrees. This greatly increased scour on the old bridge piers, which eventually caused its failure. The following shows a sequence of aerial photographs from 1942 to present, showing the changes of the bars and the river channel at the Geyserville Bridge. You can see the Geyserville Bridge in the middle of the photograph, and actually the channel is more toward the east bank than it is per the current west bank configuration. But what's important is to see how straight it is coming into the bridge. Again, coming straight at those piers is actually to minimize the scour uh, at the constriction of the bridge. By 1961, the bank had actually become pretty stable on the east side, showing lots of vegetation cover, and some pretty good cover on the west bank as well. But what's important is to see that the channel is actually on the other side of the river from its present configuration. You can see the effects of agricultural land encroaching on the river. This is an area where the river was probably three times as wide as shown as this photograph. Now, it is still subject to flooding and change. By 1974, the channel shifted to the west side, and the gravel bar formed on the east side. This is the beginning of the more modern sequence. You can see that the channel is still narrowed by the land reclamation, but you can also see that the channel flow is still very straight to the bridge. And the gravel bar looks like it has a lot of scour. There's not much vegetation on it. So chances are it's a very low alternate bar. Thus, it's not a point bar causing a lot of bank erosion. 